Every semester, on the first day of class, I invite my students to join me on a spaceship. I say we are all aliens traveling across the ether faster than the speed of light on our way to planet Earth to do a little anthropological research, circa 2013. When we get there, here's what we would discover. In the first instance, we would notice that there are 11 million millionaires. And at the same time, 60% of people live on just 6% of the world's income. Nearly 1 billion people have no access to safe drinking water. And over a billion people practice open defecation because they lack access to, sa to sanitation facilities. 100 million children are not in school, 60% of them girls. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of kids serve as child soldiers. 27 million people are currently being held captive as sex slaves or in some form of bonded labor. That is three times the amount of people that suffered throughout the 300-year African slave trade. And finally, there's climate change the most fundamental crisis to ever confront humanity. And why? Because people are unwilling to face the reality that overconsuming finite resources is simply unsustainable. So I ask my students, how are they doing over there? And they respond, wow, they could be doing so much better. In the face of these social and environmental injustices, some of us feel rage and some of us feel impotent, while others turn a blind eye. So I invite you to consider these two quotes in juxtaposition. Polish poet Stanislaw Lech once wrote, each snowflake in an avalanche pleads not guilty. So in other words, we've got a whole bunch of snowflakes running around saying, whoa, not my fault. Uh, little old me, what have I got to do with that big old avalanche? On the other hand, Italian preacher St. Francis of Assisi once said, all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. All the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. What that speaks to is the power of one. Gandhi, King, Mother Teresa, and as of three days ago, our dearly departed Mandela. So we can pretend the problems don't exist and that we're not responsible, or we can engage, accept that people are suffering and do something about it. And the only difference in these two attitudes is empathy. And that's what I want to talk about. Imagine for a moment a typical lottery machine, except in this case, the number of balls bouncing around inside is equivalent to the number of people on the planet, so roughly about 7 billion, plus or minus. And on the day you were born, one ball popped out from the machine with your life's lucky number on it. In other words, where on the planet you were born to which set of parents. Now, how many of you here today would give up your ball for a chance at a better one. My guess is none of you would, and that's because the odds of a better ball are overwhelmingly stacked against you. I learned about this lottery machine metaphor when I traveled with a group of students to Omaha, Nebraska to meet with legendary investment superstar Warren Buffett. And on that day, he shared with us that we had all won the ovarian lottery. And with that kind of privilege comes great responsibility. And in his case, that means donating billions of dollars. What he's responding to, because he can imagine himself and the hardship that people face when they haven't won the ovarian lottery, what he's responding to is cognitive empathy. My dear friend Jennifer also is committed to helping other people, but her motivation is fueled by something different. Jen is the founder of a social enterprise, which empowers women through entrepreneurship training. Recently, they completed a five-day workshop in Bolivia. 
20 women traveled from far and wide to attend this workshop. None of them were formally educated. All of them were farmers or artisans. On the first day of the workshop, the, the facilitators wrote down a dozen words on large sheets of paper and hung them up on the wall. And then they invited the participants to come down and write down their name under each word they felt described them in some way. The words that they identified with were mother, seamstress, and weaver. At the end of the workshop, the organizers repeated this exercise, and to everyone's amazement, virtually all of the women put their names under a whole new set of words, including entrepreneur and leader. After five short days, they saw themselves in a new light as potent, capable, strong women. My friend Jennifer wept when she told me that beautiful story because she recognized that what sh the work she's doing is much less about entrepreneurship training and much more about empowering women to embrace their full potential and step into their greatness. What's at play here is affective empathy. So to recap, when you imagine yourself in someone else's shoes, that's cognitive empathy. And when you feel what someone else is feeling, that's affective empathy. And when these two phenomena come into alignment, that's when the power of empathy is huge. In fact, I reckon there's only one force on this entire planet stronger, and that is love. Empathy trumps pity, sympathy, compassion, words that are often used interchangeably when they are not synonymous. In fact, I situate empathy on what I call an altruistic emotion continuum. On one side is pity, which is an emotional response to someone in distress, full of misfortune. But pity regards its object as inferior, and oftentimes with contempt. Bottom line is when you pity somebody, you look down on them. But as you make your way across this continuum and you get to empathy, that's where things start to get really interesting. Because when you empathize with someone, you recognize that you share a common humanity. We all have very different circumstances on this planet. And most of that is dictated by the ovarian lottery system. But at the end of the day, we are all inherently worthy as human beings. Today, empathy research is on fire, and with very good reason. Breakthroughs in neuroscience have proven what the mystics and sages have been saying for millennia, and that is that we are all born with the innate capacity to empathize, regardless of where you come from, nationality, race, social class, or age. And just like you go to the gym and you bulk up your biceps by doing curls, you can become more empathic with practice. Listen to this. The adult brain contains roughly 100 billion neurons. And each neuron has about 5,000 connections called synapses. The number of probable combinations or possible combinations of 100 billion neurons firing together is approximately 10 to the power of a million. That's one followed by a million zeros. And just to blow your mind, by comparison, the number of atoms in the entire known universe is a mere 10 to the power of 80. So, as we go through life and face the deluge of stimuli that we encounter all day long, every day, new neural pathways are being co created constantly. Our brains are always changing, and this is known as brain plasticity. And since we are in charge of what we think about, and for how long, we literally control our brain's transformation. This begs the question for me, what would happen if we all spent more time thinking empathic thoughts? And more importantly, what if we all started engaging in more empathic action? Empathic action to me unleashes the true power of empathy, 
because it forces us to confront social injustices not as spectators, but as participants fully committed to entering in dignity and suffering. And guess what? Engaging in empathic action has positive implications for self and society. It's true, you and everyone else stand to gain personally by engaging in empathic action. Recent scientific breakthroughs again are revealing that the same reward and pleasure centers in the brain when you're in service to others light up as do when you're taking cocaine, heroin, or when you're engaged in really great sex. And remarkably, empathic action also reduces anxiety and stress and it diminishes depression, it heightens immune system functioning, it elevates self-esteem, it improves personal relationships, and it even boosts workplace productivity. So here's a final word on empathy. Despite the fact that we're living in a global village with an extraordinary capacity for interconnectedness, I believe we lack a sense of interdependence. As humans, we have a deep-seated need to be in communion with one another and to be in service to one another. So we don't just need an explosion of empathic action to thwart catastrophe, we need it to flourish as human beings. Soon we're gonna be nine billion people on this planet, on this very beautiful planet, sharing one common destiny. Victor Hugo once famously said, there is only one thing more powerful than all the armies in the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. I believe the time has come to leverage the power of empathy and embark on a global empathic action revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, and especially those students I love, I really would love to see you there. Thank you.